Okay, so let's see if we can organize the screen a little differently, make it e making it easier for you to read this text because I think it was just way too small. I, I'm not going to change the others because I believe you can follow along uh, with your version of the textbook, whatever you have. Uh, so we'll just continue in that manner. All right. Um, why can't I control this a little bit better? Show magnifier? I don't know what that means. Oh, well, that's interesting. I can do that too, I guess. I have magnifier. I don't know. All right, so uh, this section is comparing linear and exponential functions. We already did a little bit of that when I introduced the exponential functions. Remember that uh, linear functions are repeated addition. So I'm going to add that slope value however many times uh, the value of x. So if x is 25, I'm going to take 25 and multiply it times m. Why? Because multiplication is repeated addition. So linear functions are repeated addition. In contrast to that, an exponential function is repeated multiplication. The exponent tells me how many times to multiply the base of my power, or in this case, we call it either the growth or decay factor. Okay. So again, exponential functions, repeated multiplication. Linear functions are repeated addition. And, and they just say that here. Uh, a linear function represents a quantity to which a constant amount is added for each unit increase in the input. An exponential function is a constant factor, is multiplied by a constant factor. So it's multiplication. So repeated multiplication versus repeated addition. So here's our first example. Uh, identifying ex exponential functions in a data table. So how do we determine if a function is either exponential versus linear? Okay, so example one gives us this table, 5.5, and you should follow along, but I'm also going to uh, overlay this, I think. We're going to try to do it that way. We'll see how, how it works out. Um, but we have this table, x is 0, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and the function f of x is at 0, x equals 0, the function is equal to 25. F at x equals 2, the function is equal to 50. At x equals 4, the function is equal to 75, and so on. Function g is 0, 100, 2, 196, 4, 384, 6, 752, and so on. So I believe through our work though, so, that's so far this semester that we know that if a function is linear, my x values and my function values have a constant slope, right? So if I have 0, 25, 2, 50, 4, 75, 6, 8, 10, and 100, 125, and 150. Some of you could see it straight away. Some of us might need to check to make sure. So what's the difference between those two? 50 minus 25 is equal to 25. 75 minus 50 is equal to 25. 100 minus 75 is equal to 25. 125 minus 100 is equal to 25. And 150 minus 125 is equal to 25. Now, that means each of these is the same, a change of 25. So my change in y is equal to 25 for each of these steps from one point to the next. Now, if these are not equivalent steps, the intervals are not the same, then it's going to be a problem because then my slope won't be constant. But in fact, this is 2 minus 0 is 2. This is a step of 2. This is an increase of 2. This is an increase of 2. This is an increase of 2. And this is also an increase of 2. So my change in x is equal to 2. So if I wanted to calculate the slope of that function, that would be slope equals change in y divided by change in x, and that would be 25 divided by 2, which is 12 and a half. Or you could just leave it as 25 over 2. So the slope of that line would have been 12.5, or 25 over 2. And it is, in fact, a line. Again, if one of these numbers was 1, if one of them just happened to be 1, any one of them, or if one of these was not 25, then my line would, this set of data would not be linear, strictly so, okay? Now let's look at the other function. So I have now x and g of x. I don't think I want this over that far. So 
let's do that. And let's just copy this down. I got 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. And I have 100, 196, 384, 0 0.16, 752. I would hope that the decimals would give you a clue as to, well, the difference between this is 90, these two is 96. The difference between these two will not be exactly 96, so this is definitely not linear, right? So hopefully you can see that. 1475.79 and 2892.55. Now, how do I know that it's exponential? Well, remember, exponential means there's a multiplicative factor that's constant. In other words, that A value is constant. So what did I have to multiply 100 by to get 196? So how do I figure that out? 196 divided by 100 equals 0.96. Now, what's the change here? Well, that's going to be 384. 0.16 divided by 196. And let's see if we get that same amount. 384.16 divided by 196. I'm sorry, we get 1.96 here. And this we get 1.96. And then if I take 752.95 and divide that by 384.16, what will we find? 752.95 divided by 384.16 and I get one point some rounding going on here 1.9599 so that's approximately equal to 1.96 it's just because we end up having to round this number and or that number uh, I suspect it's this one okay and we would have to do that for each of these intervals so we did it for this one we did it for that change, we did it for this change. We would have to do it for these two to continue to determine or confirm that this is an exponential function. So now, notice how this goes up for every two values in x. So this is not my a value. Really, uh, if I were to write this function, and so uh, if I do that, then my let's just go ahead and figure out how to write this function. So g of x is equal to 100. That was my starting value. And my a value is 1.96 to the t, where t is equal to an, a single interval. But one interval is equal to two x's. Now, let's solve this for x. If I want x must equal 1 over 1 is each x value is half of an interval. Okay? So that means when for t I'm going to substitute in x over 2. And how does that make sense? Well, let's think about this. g of x equals 100. 1.96. Trying to think of how to how to explain this to you so that so it's easy um, or intuitive. If I had t in here, if I put one in, if x equals one, I would have to put what in for t? Well, I'd have to put in one half, correct? If x is equal to two, t is equal to one. So that's so that's how we need to think about it, just like that. So how do we convert this? So instead of using t up here, we want to use x. Well, it would be g of x equals 100, 1 1.96. And it's, if I'm going to put 1 in there, I'm going to put 2. So whatever value I put in for x, I have to divide it by 2, right? If I want to put 2 in for x, I'd have to divide it by 1 for it to be there. So it's going to be x over 2. So again, if I put in... 1 for x, I will be putting half into this. If I put in 2 for x, I'll be putting 1 in for the t interval. So this is the equivalent fraction, or the equivalent function. And I suppose technically this should be a cap t. Uh, I was writing g of x. And when I convert it to g of x, it looks like this. Now remember, in the last video, I showed you how to absorb this half into my equation. And I do that by splitting my 
exponent to two pieces, 1.96 to the 1 half, raise all that to my x. When I multiply these, it comes back to this, right? So when I multiply those two, it comes back to be x over 2. So then I can take 1.96 and absorb the 1 half by doing the following in the calculator. Uh, what am I doing? 1.96 to the 1 half. And so I get 1.4. And so g of x equals 100 times 1.4 to the x. OK? And that's it for example 1. And let's go check our answers. So the function f of x is linear, and the change in x is 2. Change in y is 25. The function of g of x is not linear, and outputs are not constant. And so they showed us that it doesn't actually work. Uh, b is a exponential function. We jumped ahead. And I showed you that when I take those and divide them, divide the next point divided by the previous point, as long as the x intervals are the same, I get 1.96 each time. They didn't ask us to write the function, I jumped ahead, okay? So for a table describing y as a function as a function of x, where delta x is constant, if the difference between the consecutive y values is constant, the function is linear. If the ratio is constant, the function is, expo is exponential. So remember, it says when the change in x is constant, in other words, that this 2 plus 2 this stepping of 2, the stepping of 2 here in the x values, if those are all the same values, uh, a change in 2, 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 if I delta x is 2 or constant in general, then we will have, uh, then we can check to see if it's an exponential function and a linear function. All right? So example 2. Uh, we have a discussion here about, um, well, we're going to get to example two, uh, linear versus exponential model through two points. So we have a town that's 20,000 to 24,000 over a five-year period. The population increases. The town council is concerned about the population rapidly growing. Towns have to keep track of how many teachers they need, how big the school physically has to be, other resources that the town provides, fire department, police, etc. So they, they monitor the population and how fast it's growing or how much, how quickly it's decaying. If we let uh, t equal the number of years and p equals population size, then when t is equal to zero, p is equal to 20,000. So what they're telling us is how do we build an exponential model versus how do we build a linear model? So if I were to take this information and build a linear model, I would have 0, 20,000 as a point, and that's going to be for both a linear or exponential model. So that means this is my y-intercept, right? Now, if I had a five-year period that at the end of the five years I had 24,000 people, if I want to find the average rate of change, my second point is 5, 24,000. And so my average rate of change is the slope, 24,000 minus 20,000 divided by 5 minus 0 which is 4,000 divided by 5, which is, should be 400, well, 800, right? 800, right? So I'm gaining 800 people per year for five years, and I'll get 4,000, excuse me, 4,000 people, all right? Yeah. And so my linear function looks like this. Uh, I guess we'll say P equals 800, and they're using t plus my initial amount, 20,000, OK? Now, that's our linear model. If we're going to build an exponential model, and you'll need to pay attention to this and know how to do it, we can build an exponential model also with two points if one of our points is our starting value. If, it's, if one of our points is not the starting value, it's going to be super, super complicated to write to write out the function. But if one of these is our initial amount, it makes it significantly easier. So our exponential model starts out with our initial value, which is 0, 20,000. 
It's also our y-intercept. And so my remember my gener generic form or general form of my equation looks like this, P, I use the same variables, C, my initial amount, my growth factor, because we know we're growing in this particular case, T. So population, if you wanted to, we would do it the long way. We can just put 20,000 in for C if we understand that. If you don't remember, you can build it out, right? We don't know what C is, we don't know what A is, but if I put 20,000 in, in for my population, and I put C, since I don't know what it is, in for my initial amount, remember this is if you don't recall that the, starting, the initial amount is 20,000, that's gonna be multiplied times A, and what do I put in for T? Well, I put zero in for T. So what is A to the zero? a to the 0 is equal to 1, so I get 20,000 equals c times 1, which of course is just c. So I've just confirmed that c, my starting amount, is 20,000. Now let's rewrite our formula. It's now p, any future population, equals 20,000, my initial population or starting amount, times a to the t. Now I still don't know what a is. But we can use the second point. Remember, our second point was 5, 24,000 to determine what this A value is. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to substitute my dependent variable, 24,000, in for P. And that's equal to my initial amount, C, times A to the T value that goes with this 24,000, which was the how many years later, and so 5 goes in for t. So I'm going to take 20,000, divide both sides by it. So this goes to 1, 20,000 on this side, and I get 24,000. I don't know what that is. I probably should know. 24, 1, 2, 3, divided by 20,000, 1, 2, 3, 3. Yep, equals 1.2. So this becomes 1.2 equals a to the fifth. Now, how do we get rid of this a to the fifth? Remember, I'm going to raise both sides to the one fifth. And five, let's do the different color here. Five times one fifth is equal to one. So I get a to the one, which is just a. So when I do this math here, I'm going to figure out what a is. Again, how do I do that? I'm going to put 1.2, 1.2 carat to the 1 fifth, 1 divided by 5. I put in parentheses, not because I need to, because I don't with this particular operating system in this mode, but some of you may if you have an older calculator. And so that is my A value. And so my function looks like this. P equals 20,000 times, or you can just put parentheses, 1.0371372289 to the T. You could have also left it this way, probably because it's easier to write, even though some of you don't like fractions. We could have written it as um, 1.2 and we could have this one-fifth here, and then multiply that times the t, so we get t over 5. So we could have written that these two are the exact same function. They're going to probably generate slightly different numbers because this value, the 1.0371372289, is probably rounded. Okay? So let's see what the question actually asked us to do, uh, or the discussion. So they talk about this information and the two points that we can get, and they constructed a linear model. And that, of course, is what we got as well, this P equals 20,000 plus 800T. And then constructing an exponential model, they're going to do exactly what I suggested that we did. They skipped that long way and just inserted this initial amount, the initial population, and then they used the two points from two data points. Um, and again, if one of the data points is not your initial amount, it becomes uh, a cumbersome exercise for you guys at at this point in time. Hopefully later in the semester it won't be as cumbersome. All right, so the five-year the five -year growth factor, a to the fifth, is 1.2. You can find the annual growth rate, and they did that thing. They said 1.0371, which is what we got as well, and there's our function, okay? So they didn't ask us what the, to do with that, but here we are.
Uh, what are they talking about? Oh, we used a similar method to find the growth factor of the decay of caffeine in example six on the other page. So that was the video before this one. Okay. So translating growth or decay factor from n time units to one time unit. So this is this a to the one nth. If a is the growth factor, this is me telling you that we can do this thing, this one fifth, and turn it into this decimal value instead of having 0.7 to the one fifth. I don't particularly prefer one way or the other. Um, some people will say that it strictly should be this. I would say that it depends. Um, it's actually easier to write this, in my opinion. We don't have all these decimals and it's more accurate, but whatever, okay? But we've done this twice now in video and hopefully you'll have, to, you'll have done it a number of times in your practice problems. So here's example two. So example two, and now I'm working with purple, example two making predictions with our models. For our problem on population growth, the population size is the same in both models for year zero and year five. So they're pulling the data from the work that we just did. So year zero was 20,000 and year five was 24,000, excuse me, was 24,000. So now they're asking, what would the two models predict for years 10, 15, 20, and 25. So remember our linear model, which I think I did in blue, the linear model, that was a bad L, the linear model was uh, population equals 20,000 plus 800T. So what did our linear model predict for years 10, 15, 20, and 25? So um, we can do this manually, so you could substitute 10 15, 20, and 25 in there, but I think I'd rather do it the following with the calculator, but it's up to you. Um, I wish I could remove this. I can't, as far as I know. Let's see if I can figure this out. Hide status bar? No. So I'd rather do it this way. If I go to y equals and I input, instead of y, instead of p, I have y1. So if I input 20,000 plus 800t, and in case instead of t, I'm going to have x, that's going to be my linear function, right? While I'm here, I'm going to input the uh, exponential function, my initial amount, 20,000 times parentheses 1.2 raised to the, what do I want to do, x over 5. So I'm going to type in x divided by 5. And that's just doing it that other way, right? I don't like how this is formatted, so let's go delete, 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 delete. Do that, then raise it to the x divided by 5. Again, if you have a, an older calculator, that's not going to work. You have to put parentheses around that. Okay, so there are two functions. But I'm going to turn this one off. How do you turn that off? If you don't know, you go over here and put your cursor on the equal sign and hit enter, and it will turn that one off. See, it's not no longer highlighted because I want to do this problem kind of in order the way they're asking us to do it. So this is going to graph it. It's not going to show up. So I'm going to hit zoom. I got to wait for it to finish cranking it out. Now I'm going to hit zoom. Uh, standard. So six. It should readjust so I get some of the graph in the, uh, maybe not, zoom. That was zoom. Standard. I guess I'm going to go zoom out. Uh, I really want to set the, set the window then, I guess. Uh, X min. I don't care about that. X max, I don't care about that. 
X scale, I don't care about that. Y min, let's go um, negative 10 is fine. Y max, I want to put it 20,000. No, I want to put it at like 40,000. Okay. And let's just enter the, hit enter the rest of the way. I don't care about the trace step. And so now let's hit graph again. And so now I'm seeing my line. Okay. And then when I graph the exponential, we're going to see the upper part of that exponential function. So now what I want to do is, because we want to know all of these other values, 10, 15, 20, 25, I want to go to table. Okay. So let's go to table, second table. And at x equals 10, I have 28,000. So I have at x equals 10, I have 28,000. And this would be easy. You could just add, add the amount too if you wanted to. 15, 20, and 25 they wanted. Okay. So like if you had this as a homework problem, this is what we want to do. I can't use this screen like this. It functions as a calculator. So I have to scroll down and get to 15 and then 20 and 25. I know I didn't stop at 15, but I'm going to get here. 32,000. And then 20, 20 is 36,000. And 25 is 40,000. But yeah, clearly you can see that for every five years, I'm going to add 4,000. So you could have just added 4,000 to each previous value. That's the simplicity of a linear model. Now, they ask us to construct a table and a graph to show these predictions. So we still have to do the predictions for the exponential model, which I think I did in purple, right? So in purple, our exponential model would look like this. P equals 20,000 times either 1.2 or 1.0371, I think it was, 371, 317, whatever it was, to the T or X. Um, I put it in the other way, but again, they're the same function. Yeah, 371, because it's right up there uh, on the top of my page. So um, now I'm going to go back to the y equals, and I'm going to turn this equation back on by hitting the down arrow over to the left and hitting enter. And so now my function will be graphing. And there is my exponential function. On the left-hand side, it's a little more, and it's going to go right through, and it's going to grow. It looks like it's growing very slowly, but I'm only going from... 0 to 10. That's only 10 years later. So if we go back and change the window again, and we change my x value to maybe go out to 30, so I don't care about that one because we're not going to go back in time. But if I change this to 30, that's 30 years from now, right? And graph it again. And we're going to see this blow out of here. But we're also not going to see what happens to it because it's gonna it's getting cut off here so I need to jump up to my y value to be up to probably like 80,000 let's see let's go our y window y max let's change it from 40,000 to 80,000 and see what happens and yeah, let's go to 100,000 what the heck it's only digital space uh, poopy face Okay, and so let's hit graph and see what happens. So it's going to regraph both of them. There's the line. Here's my exponential function out to what did I type in? Thirty years, forty years, thirty years. I think it was thirty years and eighty thousand. So this is climbing up to whatever that is. So I put a hundred thousand. So it looks like maybe an eighty thousand would have been better. Might have shown it more uh, explosive growth in comparison. So what are those values? Let's go back to our table. So let's go second table, and here is our y1. That's the linear, and here's our y2. So see how that works? And so I don't have the 10 because I'm going to have to scroll up, but this, this view has all the other three, 15, 20, and 25. So at 15, I'm going to have 34,560. 34, and notice that that's 2,500 more people. And then at year 20, I'm going to have 41,472. And at 25 years, I'll have 49,766. So it doesn't seem like that much, but consider this. This is up almost 20% more than, I'm sorry, almost 25% more than this number, right? Percent change. 
take twenty, take one quarter of that, which is ten thousand, and add another ten thousand. So this is twenty five percent more than, is a twenty five percent increase over that guy, over the forty thousand. Okay. Now let's go get that ten, so we can complete the problem, and it's at twenty eight eight. So not that much of a difference at that lower level. So at ten, it's twenty eight eight. But notice how it just skyrockets as we get as we move further down the x axis. As x increases, we move in the y direction, the height of our function grows very, very quickly, okay? What are some limitations in using these models to make predictions? Um, well, we should really be talking about extrapolation versus interpolation. If we're extending beyond five years, because our two data points are year zero and year five, if we're extending beyond that five years, that's extrapolation, and our model may most likely not be accurate, okay? Um, I don't know if I don't know what the book discusses. I didn't look at it ahead of time, but um, I would question both models because I don't know if we are growing linearly or if we're growing exponentially. What I would want is additional data points. So maybe if we have it in the books, we should go look at the population numbers for uh, the years in between zero and five, and then the sixth year add that data and see exactly how we're growing. Are we growing linearly or exponentially? That's what I would suggest. They get the table that we got. We got. We have a different number here, but probably because they use the 1.0371, and I use the 1.2 to the to the one fifth. So that's why that's the reason for the disparity. Let's see what the discussion has. We have the graph there. You could again graph it in Desmos. You wouldn't be able to. I'm. Mean, you can get tables, but I'm not sure how to do it. It's in there somewhere. I just don't. Not familiar with the pulling the tables up for Desmos. And uh, here's their discussion. Both models should be considered as generating only crude future estimates, particularly since we construct the models using only two data points. Clearly, the further out we predict, the more unreliable the estimates become. And that's pretty much what I said, right? When we extrapolate, you can't be very comfortable with those numbers. Okay. Comparing the average rates of change. Now, this goes back to the earlier portions of chapter two and the math we were doing with average rates of change. When we want to calculate average rates of change, for instance, remember we'd have exponential models, some of the problems I gave you, and they gave you this point, you had to figure out what that point was, and then you found the average rate of change between those two points. What would that be? That's the slope of the line that jo joins those two points, right? If I had chosen two different points, for instance, let's say that same point there, but this one here, the average rate of change between those two points is different because the slope is more gradual. It's not as steep. So another way to compare linear and exponential functions is to examine average rates of change. Recall that if n is a function of t, then we get this uh, change in n divided by change in t. That's slope, right? Uh, and so they're going back to this n calculation, but it doesn't matter. Think about the problem we just did and use p and t there. And we, would, we know that the slope, the rate of change between different numbers would be more extreme in the, linear ver in the exponential model versus the linear. So let's just do this. Let's calculate the average rates of change between 0 and 25 years for both the linear and exponential model. Okay? So for my linear model, again, that one was in blue. So for my linear model, my average rate of change okay, would be the slope between these two points. Um, let's use 0 and 20,000. That's 0 and 20,000 for both models. And then for the linear model, the 25 would be 40,000. That's not to say that our prediction is correct. Let's, I'm trying to show you the most extreme example. So that'd be 40,000 minus 20,000 over 25, which of course is 20,000 over 25, which if I go to my trusted calculator, I gotta go second quit. Um, I'm gonna take 20,000 and divide it by 25. And I get 800. Why do I know that? And because it's the, it's the, that was the slope of, oh yeah, because that's the slope, I'm an idiot. I didn't need to do that, right? We knew that was the slope of our line. But for the exponential model, for the exponential model, my average rate of change between those two points, I actually have to calculate. I shouldn't have had to calculate but that, but I wasn't thinking. So my initial value was the same, right? And my 
25 year mark was at, we'll use their number, 49720. Okay, so my average rate of change, it's not slope, so it's average rate of change is equal to 49720 minus 20,000 divided by 25. Now, is this going to be more steep or is it going to be more shallow, more flat than the linear model? Well, we're going to get um, 29,720 divided by 25, and we're not going to get 20, 29,720, uh, I think it was. Close enough. And we get a slope, not a slope, but an average rate of change of 1188.8. So again, my linear model looked like my linear model looked like this. My ex exponential model looked like this, right? And when we took the when we took the at the 25-year mark, let's say the slope between these two points for the linear line was the same as the slope, but the average rate of change is the same as the slope of the line, but the average rate of change between this point and that one here for the exponential function is higher. So slope here was 800 as it was for the whole function because it's a line and then the average rate of change which would be the same idea of slope is 1188.8. So I mean I go up much more for this same travel in horizontal distance. Okay? Example Three. Oh, well, we're comparing average rates of change. We were just talking about that, and I just did it with a whole completely different example. We're talking about it here. There's no average rate of change for that. That's the exponential model. In the long run, exponential growth always will always outpace linear growth. In other words, if you're growing exponentially, it's going to be way faster. Your function is going to rise much, much faster than any line uh, if you're having the same starting point. Okay? And here they don't even have the same starting point, right? That's our initial value on the exponential function. That's the initial value on the linear function. Notice how the exponential function, if you give it enough time, it's just going to scream away, run away, not even close. Okay? And there are your exercises. Well, of course, we're doing them in mom, but I'm just showing you it's the end of the section. All right? So hopefully that wasn't even a half hour, but we'll see. And hopefully this is fairly clear to you what we're doing. Um, that's it.